No matter what time of year it is, your feet can be sandal ready. We all know there are hundreds of thousands of feet that are in need of some serious help, and O oh for Feet Sake by Barmaids can help. O oh for Feet Sake is a solid foot moisturizer, and Barmaids uses the perfect combination of skin loving oils, butters, and ingredients ideal for your feet, including essential oils. You will be amazed at how quickly O oh for Feet Sake can turn your feet from rough and dry to smooth and soft. Just follow the instructions and in less than two weeks you will see drastic improvement to your feet. You can purchase O for Feet Sake at www.bar-maids.com. There are two scents, Soft Vanilla and Peppermint Plus. Hi and welcome to Knitting Blooms. Today is Friday, February 15th and this is episode number 94. My name is Tina, also known as Blooming Knitter, and welcome to the show. Thanks so much for taking time out to uh, join me today. I have a full show for you today. I have a lot to talk about, and the tutorial today is um, spinning on a wheel. However, when I I haven't had a chance to look at the, the, the video footage of the tutorial yet, but I know that what I recorded was about 45 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split the tutorial in two. I'm going to try and find an easy breaking point and play half of it this week and half of it next week uh, because I have a lot of other things to talk to you about today. So let's jump right into it. This week has been extremely busy, which is one of the reasons why I haven't had a chance to look at that footage yet. I recorded that last Sunday, and I've been meaning meaning to review it and edit it and everything um, this week. Just have been busy. Um, one of the things that has been keeping me busy this week is uh, my running. I have been... Um, getting in my workouts every single day. Last year, I had actually set a goal for myself to run a thousand miles. And when I started thinking about the goal, it was already, we were already a good part into the year, but I still had more than enough time to reach that goal. Uh, because I think at the time I would have only had to run like a, a little over two miles a day um, in order to meet that goal. But needless to say, I failed miserably last year because I just wasn't working out every day and and I wasn't even working out often enough to make up the extra the extra miles. So needless to say, I, I failed miserably last year, but this year I'm already on onto a great start. I have already run and, and I'm just talking about my workouts because I do a lot of walking and I try and get a lot of walking in throughout the day but just through my workouts that I do each morning I have already um, tracked two, 212 miles to date. It's crazy. Um, this week I've been doing about seven miles, a little over seven miles a day um, in the morning. I usually run for about an hour, which is about five miles, and then I walk um, for another half hour, which gives me another two miles or so, um, depending on how fast I go. I usually try and walk um, a little bit faster than four miles an hour. Um, so it's going quite well. I'm really excited about how well it's going. Um, We'll see how if I can keep it up. At this rate, I will reach my 1,000 miles well before the end of the year. Um, so we'll see. So that's what's been keeping me busy this week. So a quick, a quick reminder about the cows that are going along, or the cow that we're currently running, um, and that is the Finish It or Frog It February, the F-cubed um, cow. And... Everybody keeps posting in the thread. I, I keep checking it out every day. So keep those those things posted, posting. And it's going to go to the end of the month. Now, I haven't gone through my prize stash just yet to pick out some prizes. But I am planning on doing at least one prize for every uh, 50 uh, people or every 50 projects that are posted. So whether it's... Um, you know, frogged or finished or whatever, it's going to be one prize for, for every 50. So get them posted. So let's get those those prizes up there so we can do two or three prizes. Um, I can't remember. I think 
I think we're about around 70 or so. I think it's on the third page. So it's, I think it's already over 50. But um, I can't remember. I've looked at so many threads today. But uh, And then next month, again, we're going to be doing the dye along. I'm hoping to record the uh, fiber tutorial this weekend. Uh, if I can find the time on Sunday, I'm going to try and record that and maybe post it after the spinning, the second spinning tutorial. I do have a couple other spinning tutorials that I'm going to also post as well, but maybe I'll put those further into March so that at least you guys can see how to dye, how I dye fiber um, before we get to March. So if the, you wanted to dye some fiber, you could have an idea of where to go from there. And then, of course, we're going to do the Trials with Lace Knit Along in April for my pattern. Uh, so if you're interested in joining along, you can go and purchase that pattern. And there is a coupon code for um, $1 off, and that is PODCAST. So just use that coupon code if you'd like to receive $1 off your pattern. So you may have noticed that I had a bit of a wardrobe change. <laughs> Um, I finished my knit swirl, and I did have it on at the beginning of the show because actually I put it on when I was getting ready to sit down to record, and I got so warm that I had to take it off, uh, but I did finish it, and I have a better picture because I know with the way that the camera's set up, you're not going to be able to get a good view of it, but I will uh, post a picture that I took of it on my, um, dress form. And um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about it. So last week I talked to you about, I finished it off and I was ready to block it Friday night. Well, Friday night I soaked it. That went fine. I took it out of the water and I put it in a couple of towels. I just kind of laid it out and ro and rolled it up in a towel with some ShamWows, trying to get as much water out of it as I could. That went okay too. And then I laid it out just very gently because I didn't want to stretch it and started to work on weaving in the blocking wires so that I could block it. And that was fine, um, except for the fact that I didn't read the instructions and I just did it any old way I wanted to. And then I had to do it again because uh, the instructions state that you should um, go with the second welt in. And I'm not sure exactly why that is, but I went with the first welt. And then when I was trying to block it out and measure it, Things weren't coming out right, so I thought, well, maybe I really do need to go with the second walt. So I had to dig all my wires back out again, re-fish uh, them through, and then I finally got all the wires set up again, and then I started to try and pin it down, you know, to the measurement in the book. Well, I worked on that thing for well over an hour, and I could never get the... Um, the sections to be the, the right size based on what it say, stated in the um, schematic. And I mean, I could get some of them that way, but then by the time I worked my way around to the other side, they were all wonky. It was crazy. I, I repinned it about three times. And then finally I said, I'm done. I am so done with this. I'm just going to fudge it. I'm just going to make it look, um, you know, look like it's the same on each side. So I just kind of played with it a little bit, moved things around, you know, adjusted it, looked at it from up above to make sure that everything was in a line. And finally just, I didn't even pin it. I just had the blocking wires in it and just let it lay there. Well, because I don't have a big area for blocking, I didn't block it on the bed, which is normally where I block things in the spare room when, where I could close the door. Well, I had to block it in the basement, and of course the cats have access to this area, and I'm always afraid that they're going to start kneading in it or whatever because it's something different, and, you know, they're going to want to find out what it's all about. 
So what I ended up having to do is Friday night I laid some towels over top of the sweater. So if they came and decided to lay down on it, at least they were just laying on the towels. And I did put a fan on it as well to hope, to hope that it would um, dry a little quicker. So let's fast forward to Saturday afternoon. All day I kept moving the fan around and everything. Every time I left the basement I had to put the towels on the sweater so that if the cats came down they would not, um, you know, mess up the sweater. And finally Saturday evening I was moving, I, you know, I moved the arms around so because when the arms were laid out they were kind of over part of the other um, part of the sweater. So that part wasn't drying as quickly, so I moved those, and anyway, I got the whole thing dried within a day, which was amazing. But I think it had a lot to do with the fan, because I kept the fan on it the whole time. Even when the towels were on it, I figured that they would it would get more um, air that way. So I took it up Saturday night, and I kind of, at that point... Was it Saturday? Yeah, it must have been Saturday night because I thought about starting to pin it and I just, I think actually, I think I did pin it on Saturday night, but I could not get, I kept, every time I, I worked from the sleeves and into the neck, you know, there was all these big gaping areas. And literally after I had pinned it with my um, interlocking markers, I was like, I was done. I did not, I was so frustrated with it. The blocking was frustrating. The pinning it was frustrating because I don't know if, um, you know, it was just like somehow I got stretched out or what exactly, but I was just so frustrated. And really Saturday night, I was ready to say, I'm done. Last week, I was ready to knit another one. Saturday night, I was like, nope, <laughs> not knitting another one of these. This is too frustrating. And... What not. So, Saturday night, I just put it away. I didn't even want to look at it. It wasn't until late Saturday, Sunday afternoon, that I decided, well, let me pull it out. Let me see what, I, what I'm working with and, you know, go from there. And I just started to seam it and things were going quite well, better than I expected them to. I did have to kind of, not fudge, but, you know, if you saw the mattress stitch tutorial that I did a few weeks ago, um, you will have seen that you're supposed to pick up two to two, but in this sweater, I definitely, two bars to two bars, and in this sweater, I definitely couldn't do that because I would have had a gaping hole um, on the back part compared to the collar that was cast off. So I kind of just eyeballed it. You know, I when I pinned my... Um, when I pinned everything, I made sure that there wasn't too much of a gaping hole. So as long as I paid attention to what what I was dealing with in that one section, one section at a time, I was able to, you know, adjust wherever I needed to. And it, it seemed to come together quite well. So I ended up finish seaming it on Sunday night. And like I said, it was much easier than I had expected it to be. And it turned out, I mean, I was expecting it to look like it was bunched up on one side, but it really doesn't. It looks really nice. I do have a few ends to weave in because I haven't um, woven the ends from my um, mattress stitch. And the reason, one of the reasons is because um, this here it folds over my sleeves are so long i can't believe it laura i don't know if you're gonna have to increase your sleeves my sleeves i mean look how far i have to roll them over because they're so long and even still they still come over my hand um but what i'm trying to decide i seamed this up so that it was actually seamed from this side and Looks like I got something else going on there. Um, but I seamed it up so that it was coming from this side. But if I'm going to roll this over all the time, I might want to change this because whenever I have a sweater that I that I know I'm going to roll over all the time, I will reverse the seam and seam it from this side um, so that the so that this 
like kind of, I don't know what this is called, selvage, is on the inside. So I'm trying to decide if I want to do that or not. Um, I kind of, I mean, look, I mean, it is, this isn't even um, all the way. I mean, I think I, I if I'm standing up, <laughs> I mean, my sleeve is so long. There's no way I can wear my, my sweater like that. And um, yes, if it's cold out and I want to be, you know, snuggled up in it, that's great, but I don't know. I would probably be wearing it folded over at least that much most of the time. And this sweater is warm. It is so warm. I think it's the alpaca. I think it's alpaca. I want to say it's alpaca, merino, and silk. Don't quote me on that. Anyway, it is so warm. I mean, I feel like I'm going to start sweating here in a minute. <laughs> but... Um, I like it. I like how it turned out. I like how the seaming turned out. Like I said, I was really nervous about how that was all going to turn out when I was doing it last Sunday. But in the end, it worked out fine. I'm excited about starting another one. I don't know that it's going to be right away because there are several other sweaters that I want to work on. But it, um, I do like it. I do like the construction. I like the, the feel of it. Um, I think if I make another one, I'm going to make a shorter one because this one is quite long. It goes down um, pretty much past my past my butt. So, But it is going to be definitely very, very warm. So I like it. I don't know how much I'll be able to wear it at Knittopia this year because this was our knit along uh, for Knittopia 2013. And we're going to be at the end of April with, with Knittopia this year. And it's probably going to be quite warm. And so I don't know how much where I will get out of it at Knitopia, but it definitely is going to be a nice snuggle up sweater when it's cold or if I just want to, you know, wear it, wear it out as a jacket. Um, I'm not sure exactly how I will, um, close it. I tried using a shawl pin, um, a nice big chunky wood, um, shawl pin. And I think that's probably what I will use most of the time or like, um, just like a, a wooden stick that's, like for a shawl pin. So anyway, it's done. It's completed. It's been hanging on my um, dress form all week, which is what they recommend. And I love it. Definitely, definitely will be doing another knit swirl at some point in the future. Okay, another costume change because I had to take that knit swirl off because it was hot. Um, if we ever are without heat, that's going to be the first sweater I go for. Um, so now I will talk to you about my whips this week. I almost exclusively worked on my Even Star this week. I did work on, um, a sock that I'm working on for the tutorial because I'm starting to try and, um, get some of those recorded so that I'm kind of up ahead a little bit. Um, I, I've liked having the spinning tutorials ready to go other than this one that I did last week. Um, I have, like I said, I have a couple more that I've, um, I've recorded. So I have them all ready to go so that all I have to do is drop them into the current episode, um, which is making me feel a little bit more relaxed about the tutorials. So, um, I'm trying to get some of the sock tutorials recorded as well so that, um, I can be a little bit ahead of the game. Because I know that there's going to be the weeks during Knittopia that I'm not going to be able to record a tutorial. So I'd like to have a couple of things already uh, prepared. Um, I'm not sure um, what I'll probably do. is I'll probably upload them ahead of time, but just post them on that day or whatever. Anyway, so I've been working on my Even Star this week. And I've made some decent progress. Now, I have two markers on here. Um, I can't remember if I showed it to you since this marker because I was pretty sure that I had um, moved up my markers the last time, but I didn't know if I did. So this is where I started this week, but I can't remember how much I showed you before. So here, here I, here's where I am. Um, I have... 
Hmm, I think three more patterning rows, or two more patterning rows with the knit rows in between, and then a couple extra rows before I get to the edging. And if all goes well, I may even have all three of those rows, or all of those rows done tonight. Um, nah, not, maybe not all of them, but a few of them. I will, hopefully by the end of the weekend, I will be uh, working on the edging. And I did order more beads. I ordered a couple different kinds, and I had some that I had planned on using, but I also ordered some other ones that I thought might look nice, uh, but I'm not sure. I ordered some pink, almost this color, so I'm trying to decide if I'm going to use the beet, the pink or the grayish multicolor. So I'm going to put them up next to it. I might even uh, maybe string a couple and see how I like it uh, before I decide. So that's coming right along. I do want to mention one thing. You will see that there is not a lifeline anywhere close to where I am. There's one way the heck down here. And I have been tempted to string another lifeline, but I haven't done it. And one of the reasons I've been tempted is because as I move my stitches around my needles, sometimes on the needle that I'm pushing the stitches to, the end of the needle, sometimes I accidentally push a little too hard or my hand slips and I pop a couple stitches off the needles. And um, so I've been tempted to string a lifeline for that purpose only, but I haven't done it um, because I've been able to catch the stitches and everything's okay. Nothing really goes crazy because I'm really paying attention. But um, I'm still very tempted to string a lifeline just in case. But this week, I had another issue. Usually what I do is I'll do my sections, and then as I do the, um, the plain knit round in between, I will go back and count. Um, let me show it so you can see it here. I will go back and count the stitches between each marker because I have each repeat um, marked off. And before I knit that section, I will count the, the, the stitches to make sure there's enough stitches. Well, I had all the right number of stitches, so when I worked that um, plain knit row, I had the right number of stitches. But there was one section that, for some reason, it got off center. Um, so here's my center section here. I don't know how well you'll be able to see it, but there's a there's a center section here, and somehow the stitches got off. And it was on, with a knit three together, and needless to say, it was kind of off center. And at first, I thought that I forgot to do a decrease on the previous patterned row, and so I was just going to fudge it and decrease it. And then, as I worked my way across the um, the section, I realized that. I was missing a stitch on the other side, so I really paid attention and looked at it to figure out what was going on, and I did realize that it was off-center. So what I ended up having to do is I ended up dropping down two rows so that I can um, re-line up where those, um, those decreases were supposed to be. And it worked out fine. I was actually pretty impressed with myself because typically it's difficult to, to do that um, Luckily, it was only two rows down, and one of the rows was a knit row, so it wasn't too bad. Um, it did take me a couple minutes to figure out what the problem was, and then to figure out how am I going to fix this. But I did it, and I didn't have to rip back any rows. That would have not been fun, tinking 500 and some odd stitches twice for two rows. So this is coming right along, and like I said, I'm hoping that by the end of this weekend I will be on the edging and so that's very exciting. Um, I know that I think when Karen was working on hers, Karen from Around the Twist, and when um, Leslie was working on the one for Karen, their, their edging took a lot longer than they had expected. I think because it's just very tedious because there's so many beads. And I even think that Steve um, from Dramatic Knits, his might have taken longer on the edging. But I'm just going to plug right through it, and it'll be done when it's done. I'm just hoping that it is done before Knitopia. I had hoped to have it done by next week. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. Um, I can't remember how many repeats there are, but there are a lot of repeats um, that have to be done and a lot of um, edge 
rows. So I'm just going to keep plugging away at it. Like I said, hopefully next week I will have the edging done and you will, or not done, but started. And I can show you how that's coming along and show you the beads that I've decided to use. Like I said, I've, I have two beads now, two co different colors of beads. I have a grayish multicolor one and also a bright pink. So, and that's really all I've got to show you this week. Like I said, I've been working on some basic socks, but um, not too much progress on those. And that's it for whips. Okay, spinning. So, you might have noticed that the past month or so, maybe even a little longer than that, there has been very little stash enhancement. And there's two reasons for this. One is because I have a lot of stash. <laughs> and two, because I have been wanting to purchase a Hanson mini spinner. And what did I get this week? But my Hanson mini spinner, here it is. It looks so much like um, the one that Steve built me because Steve kind of used this one as a guide. Here's the one that Steve built for me that is using my ladybug um, flyer and actually my sidekick bobbin here. But here's the Hanson e-spinner. And it comes with a woolly winder, which I love. And it is super, super quiet. And like I said, Steve modeled his out of, um, that looks very much like the Hanson one. So um, actually at club, somebody thought I had already gotten the Hanson one because it looks so much alike. But this one is amazing. Amazing. I actually spun on it while Steve was in the room and he didn't even realize that I was spinning on it <laughs> because it is super quiet. I love it. I will still use the one that Steve got me. I've been using it at work. Um, like I said before, it is noisy and I can't really work on it when the guys are in the office. But I will continue to work on it. He now that now that I've gotten the Hanson one, um, he's kind of looked at it and gotten some ideas on how he can improve the um, the other one. And I'm hoping that he will um, build another another prototype that will be better than what I've got here. Because there are a few things about that one other than the noise. The noise I don't think we're going to be able to get away from. But there's some things that we can probably improve on. So. Here it is, my Hanson. It is the cherry wood. I did not get any kind of um, exotic wood. I figured they're already expensive enough, so I just got the cherry because I like the darker, the darker color than the maple. And I got the uh, the woolly winder to match, and I got a few extra bobbins as well. So I am all set with my mini spinner, and like I said, I'm so excited about it. I've already started spinning on it. Um, when it first arrived, I started spinning the sample fiber that they um, sent with it and then immediately pulled out some other fiber, which is wool gatherings. I think this is BFL. I have to double check my um, stash page. But I'm really enjoying spinning on it. I haven't spun too much on it this week because I also um, finished up the first skein of Into the World. Pullworth Silk, which I will show you in a minute. So I've been working on that, trying to get that plied up. But there it is. There's the e-spinner. I'm so excited about it. Um, it does come with a foot pedal, which I really like. And the, the toggle switch is much better, which is one of the things that I would like Steve to change on the one that he built because it's very difficult to get to the toggle switch on that one. So here it is. It's fabulous. I love it. I will be using it quite often. So let's talk about the pole war silk. So last week I showed you the green and the multi. And I had two plies of green and one ply of multi and this is how it turned out. And I love it. The green, it, it's mostly green but just the having the multi in there with it, it just gives it a splash of color. I can't wait to actually knit this up. Here, let me show you this side, because this side, there's a little bit more blue on this side, because there was some really light sections of bluish purple, or bluish gray, or whatever you want to call it. So, very, very cool. I love uh, the effect of this. 
uh, because I have the three coordinating colors. I have the green, the blue, and the multi. And I took two strands of the green and one strand of the multi for this. I will now um, spin up the blue, which I started. Um, and I haven't finished the first part. But here's the blue. And I have this much and another little um, section to spin on this bobbin. Uh, I didn't get to spin it all today because my boss decided to stay in the office all day. So annoying. <laughs> but, you know, what are you going to do? Um, so anyway, so I didn't get to spin today. Actually, I didn't get to knit much today at the office either. But, you know, there's going to be days like that. So, but this is the this is the um, the first skein. I have not um, washed it. I just took it off the nitty knotty um, just before I sat down here. I haven't soaked it or anything. And um, Kai VTM says that polar silk blooms, and the last polar silk that I had did bloom quite a bit. So I'll be interested to see how much this does bloom. Um, right now, it is a very solid fingering weight yarn. Uh, but it might bloom up a little bit once I soak it, which will be right after I finish recording here today because I am excited to see how it's going to turn out. And I'm so excited about, about it that I might even try and start knitting this up pretty quickly. So there it is. I just absolutely love it. And I probably never would have thought about doing this with the uh, fiber um, except for that in the Twisted and Arbitrary group, they did something similar to this um, a few months ago. It might have even been when this was the um, fiber. But, and then Diane, she's been spinning something. Diane from the Knittables podcast has been spinning some, um, so say, Katano? I think. I think that's what it's called. Um, and she has, it's one bright color and one, um, or one solid, semi-solid and one multicolor. And I was intrigued by that. So that's my first attempt at, um, some different kind of plying. So I love it. I can't wait to see how the blue turns out because I'll be doing two skeins of blue and one skein of the multi. And then the final third of each of them, I will do a, um, regular Navajo ply to three ply it. So it'll be interesting once all of those skeins are done up, all three of them, and see how they turn out. Um, I did not work on the alpaca at all this week. That is the next priority because I'd like to get that done. I still have, you know, a whole section and a little bit to go. I think I had a little bit more than I thought I did last week. I realized that um, there were... There was two bit, two bits in the bag where I thought there was only one. So that will be my main focus this week to get that done and hopefully start that plying uh, next week or this coming week. And that's all there is for spinning this week. Okay, now for the barmaid's drawing. The uh, barmaid's drawing this week is for a $15 off coupon. And the winner is number 18, Sampler Stitcher. And her name is Debbie. So Debbie, congratulations. You are the winner of the $15 off coupon this week. So just get in contact with me and I will get that shipped off to you. And um, there are some new products for barmaids. Uh, they're coming out with a candle. And I'm very intrigued by this. When they sent me, they sent me some new ad material, and I was reading about it, and I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting, and I went straight over to their site before I even finished reading the ad material, and I'm like, well, where is it, where is it, where is it, and it's not available yet. <laughs> it uh, won't be available until March 1st on the website, or you can purchase it at, uh, purchase them at uh, Stitches Midwest, no, Stitches West. In uh, February, I think it's next weekend at Stitches West. Um, and but they're candles; they're called um, Twisted Lights, and they sound very intriguing. And like I said, I am going to be on that website first thing, you know, March first, because I would like to try these out and see what they're all about. So, 
wait and see. <laughs> I'm hoping to have some. They're supposed to be, they're supposed to look like a ball of yarn. So that's fun in itself. And then they're supposed to last really long. And if, I mean, all the girls from Knit Club know that I love my candles and um, having nice scents. I don't know if they're, if they're scented or not, but um, I love to have candles lit. So I'm excited to try them out, and I hope you will check out the website and check out the new product, Twisted Lights, as soon as it is released. I wanted to mention about the um, drawing for the Spinner's Book of Yarn. I am still going to give that away. There is a thread in the group. I've been kind of putting it off because I'm sort of waiting for my copy to, to come to my Kindle. <laughs> because if I want to look at that book, I want to have it available. So, But I think I'm going to go ahead and do the drawing next week. So next week, I will do the drawing for the Spinner's Book of Yarn. And there will not be a barmaid's drawing next week. I will put the thread up for barmaid's, but it will be two weeks before I draw that um, that winner for barmaid's. So if you're interested in a chance to win the Spinner's Book of Yarn book, then go on over to the thread and enter to win. I just want to also remind you about the charities that are going on. Currently, I have um, in the, th in the um, show notes the um, Snuggles project that Sadie from the Yarnivore podcast is doing. And by the way, I did start a snuggle um, because on Sunday when I was dreading getting started on that Knit Swirl um, seaming, I was going to do anything and everything. That would be Marty knocking the remote on the floor. I was going to do anything and everything to ha to not have to seam that sweater. <laughs> so I started a snuggle. Didn't get very far on it. And um, I'm just going to do the grandma's favorite dishcloth pattern, but make it big enough for a snuggle. So S Sadie's doing that, that um, charity drive. So go check out her group. I have links in, in my show notes. You can go and um, check it out. Also, um... Knitting Brooklyn is doing the Remembering Remy um, knit along or their their knitting preemie hats. I think it starts later later in February and runs I think until May. So they're actually knitting um, preemie hats for Remembering Remy. And also um, Lemnit Crochet is doing the fundraising drive, I think it's through the end of March, for her friend Josh and the disease that he had, which I believe is HLH. I think that's what it was. I don't have my notes in front of me, but, but all those links are in my show notes, and you can find all the information um, on their podcast as well. So go check those out. And now for the spinning tutorial. So like I said, I recorded this last Sunday and I haven't had a chance to look at the footage so I'm going to try and split it up and probably put in about 20 minutes or so um, into this podcast because right now I think this podcast is already 40 minutes long or they are about so I don't want it to go too much over an hour but I'm going to try and put it in um about 20 minutes if I can find a good place to break it and um I hope you enjoy it In this video, I'm going to give you a brief tutorial on how to get started spinning on a spinning wheel. But first, I want to just give you one tip about selecting a spinning wheel. The one thing that I can say about selecting a spinning wheel that's right for you is to try multiple spinning wheels. That's pretty much the bottom line. If you do not have a spinning wheel shop in your area, then you can always try um, finding local people who have wheels that you'd like to try out. Uh, there might be a spinning guild in your area that you can go to and uh, they might have wheels that you could try or just checking out the wheels of the people that are there. If you have a, a shop that's an hour or two hours away, it's quite... Um, beneficial to go ahead and make that travel time and try out a few different wheels. 
when I was going to purchase my first wheel, I was looking at the wheels based on what product I wanted to turn out. And when I decided I was going to become a spinner, I said to myself, I want to spin lightweight yarn. I want to spin fingering to DK weight and possibly lace weight yarn. So everything that I had read said that I needed a wheel that had a very high ratio. And what that means is how many times the flyer or I think it's the flyer, how many times the flyer goes around to how many times the drive band wheel goes around. And so I was looking for a wheel that had a very high ratio. So I had my heart set on a couple of different wheels. And what I realized was that it doesn't matter what your ratios are. Sure, it's going to be easier with a higher ratio and you can create that yarn, but you can also create the same yarn with a lower ratio. It just is a matter of treadling faster and letting the twist build up in the fiber before allowing it to go onto the bobbin. So don't base your decision on a specific spinning wheel based on features alone. Yes, you may want a wheel that, ha that can do several different things. For instance, the Ladybug wheel, which is the wheel that I have, can is comes, I think it comes as a Scotch Tension wheel, but you can switch it to double drive. And that is very cool that you can do that. So I was, that's the wheel that I purchased because when I tried out the Ladybug, the moment that I sat down to that wheel, I felt the fluid movement of the wheel and I was able to pick up the spinning very easily. I also at the same time tried a different wheel um, that I just, every time I sat down to it, everything just seemed to kind of not work out right. So I just decided that the Ladybug was the wheel for me because it just was so... I just felt the rhythm every single time I sat down to it. And I did try these two different wheels over several days. Um, and I chose that wheel over Knittopia two years ago when Kagi Tian brought her Ladybug wheel with her and she was trying to sell another wheel as well. And I tried both wheels over a couple day period. And just every time I sat down to the shacked ladybug, I just felt that rhythm and it just seemed so fluid to me. And every time I sat down to the other wheel, it just was like, I, it was a struggle to try and get the fiber onto the bobbin. So needless to say, by the end of the weekend, I had ordered my ladybug and had it delivered to me at the retreat the following week. So that was fabulous, but yes, just try different wheels um, as much as you can. If you have your heart set on one, make sure you try it out before you um, really invest the money. And if you don't have a spinning wheel shop in your area or a spinning guild in your area, try to attend festivals that you can try different wheels out because there are a number of opportunities that you can try, try uh, wheels. So I hope that helps you with selecting your spinning wheel. Okay, before we start actually doing the spinning, I just want to go over a couple of things about the wheel uh, so that you kind of have an idea. This is the flyer that comes with, that actually this one doesn't come with the wheel. This is actually the Wooly Winder flyer that I have for my shacked sidekick. But this flyer is where the bobbin goes. And this is the bobbin, and based on whether you're doing um, a certain type of tension, in this case I'm going to be using a scotch tension, so I'm going to put the, the bobbin on this way. You see that on this end of the bobbin, the, the, um, it has a smaller whirl than on this end of the bobbin. And this end of the bobbin is used for when you are using uh, double drive. And this one is when you are using Scotch Tension. This is how the bobbin gets braked. So I'm going to place this on the flyer in this fashion because I'm going to be using the Scotch Tension on this um, tutorial. Then you have also have whirls that come with your wheel. 
you will find that you will have multiple sizes. In each one of these, there's two different sizes that you can use. Now, the smaller the whorl, the faster everything's going to turn and the more twist that's going to get into the yarn. And you need more twist for the lighter weight yarns. If you're doing a heavier worsted weight or a bulk, you might want to use the largest whorl that comes with the wheel. Now, typically, you get these four whorls with your wheel, but they usually have other wheels or other whorls that you can purchase for your wheel. In my particular case with the Shacked uh, Sidekick and the Ladybug, you can purchase two other um, whorls that each have two um, levels. Now, I don't know exactly what the ratios are on these specific ones that came with the wheel. I did purchase the, the, um, the one size smaller because, again, I like to, to spin lightweight yarn. And in order to do that without having to treadle a mile a minute, you need a smaller whorl. So, again, the smaller the whorl, the faster um, everything's going to turn and... Um, the more twist will go into the yarn. I'm just going to use the the medium size whorl, or this is, I don't know if this is considered medium. And from what I understand, it doesn't really matter which way the whorl goes on your flyer. I always just put it small side in. That's just me. I don't think it matters one way or the other. And then it's going to slide into the spot in the back here. And then the front slides in that way. Now, I've always been told that it's a good idea to have a little bit of give. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but there's just a tiny bit of give that my flyer can move in there. If it's too tight, if I push this right in there and I can't move this at all, I haven't um, tightened it down yet, but if, if I can't move this at all, I'm going to get a little bit of tension um, when I'm spinning. So I just want to have a tiny bit of give just so I can move it. And then I'm going to tighten down um, this, I think this is called the Maiden. Don't quote me on any of this terminology because I'm not 100% sure. And then I will need to lift up the, um, the brake band. This is the brake band um, that goes on the bobbin. And then also the drive band that's going to go on the, uh, the whorl. I do recommend that when you first get a wheel, you take some time uh, to just sit and get comfortable with your wheel. Probably about 15 or 20 minutes, just treadling. Just getting, getting the feet started and making sure that you can stop and then go back in the same direction again. And just um, stop and then go back the other way. Actually, that was probably not a good idea. So just keeping everything Just trying to um, treadle and just get comfortable with the wheel, knowing that you can just get it started again if you if you happen to stop. Now, if you do have if you do struggle with getting the uh, the uh, wheel going back in the right direction, I I mentioned in my drop spindle tutorial about going clockwise and counterclockwise, and this is the same way. When your flyer is turning clockwise, you are doing a Z twist. When your flyer is turning counterclockwise, you are doing an S twist. So if you're going to do the traditional method of spinning Z, spinning singles in Z, and then plying an S, then you want to make sure that your, fl your flyer is going clockwise when you are spinning your single. Now, if you have a hard time adjust, getting your feet to make it go the right way, you can always give it a little kickstart with your hand um, to, get it, to get it going in the, in the correct direction. So once you have taken some time to get familiar with your wheel, get familiar with the treadle, then you should start with just spinning yarn. Yes, this is sock yarn. So again, if... if um. I don't have a tutorial on how to put the leader on the bobbin, but 
Um, I'm sure there's one out there. If, if you need me to do a tutorial on that, just let me know and I will um, take care of that. So I have pulled it through the loops on the Wooly Winder. Again, this is the Wooly Winder. This is um, just a different type of flyer that fits this wheel that will allow the yarn to go evenly on the uh, bobbin versus having to move from hook to hook. And then I will use my orifice hook to grab that yarn, or I'm sorry, grab that leader. And then I will just get this started, and I need a little bit more tension on my bobbin. Now you can tell when you're, when you're um, either your leader or your yarn or your single or whatever is not pulling on quickly enough, you will know that you need a little bit more tension on your bobbin. So you can just adjust that tension and then try again and see how it feels. And if it's too much, then back it off just a little bit. You should be able to pull this back out just slightly, just like that, when you, um, it should have just enough, just enough um, tension on the bobbin that will pull it in nicely and you can pull it out also. Now if you're going to be spinning um, a heavy single, you might need a little bit more of tension. But again, I tend to spin a lightweight single so I need very little tension on my bobbin. So I'm going to go ahead and when you first get started, all you're going to do is just practice feeding the yarn into, into the um, orifice with the treadling and whatnot. This is a very important step, and I am so glad that Kagi TM forced me to do this. Yes, I said force because, you know, when you, when you get started and you've decided that you want to learn to spin, you just want to spin right now. You don't want to be doing practice. But she said that it was very important that I did that, and I did it for probably a good 15 or 20 minutes, and I was very thankful. So all I've done here is I've just lined my... Um, my sock yarn here that I'm spinning with my leader so that I can get it to twist up in there and hopefully it'll stay. Okay, so, so once you get your yarn on there, all you're just going to do is practice feeding it in, feeling the motion of letting it just go on to the bobbin. That's all you're going to do. Treadle and feel the motion of the treadling and the rhythm of, of drafting, but technically you're not really drafting, you're just feeding the yarn in. But this is, you're just, it's just a practice to get you started, and you're just going to continue to feed it on, and just practice that rhythm of keeping the feet going, and then feeding the single into the orifice. And again, if you need more tension on your bobbin, then you can adjust that tension. And I definitely highly recommend this uh, for at least 15 or 20 minutes before you attempt to start spinning. Yes, I know you want to just get started with the fiber and go, 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 but I can tell you that this will be very beneficial and you will be thankful that you took the time to to spin just yarn onto the bobbin to practice. So I hope you enjoyed that section of the spinning tutorial on the wheel. And like I said, next week I'll put the other half in and then when I post the, the tutorial alone, I will post it all as one piece. So hopefully that'll make it easier for you to watch um, all at one clip. Uh, but like I said, I didn't want to put 45 minutes on top of 40 minutes of show. So I hope you enjoyed the spinning tutorial and we'll come back next week for the rest of it. Okay, the last thing before I let you go for today is in regards to Knittopia. First, we will talk about Knittopia 2013. And I just want to remind everybody that we are booked for the weekends, but we do still have a couple of midweek spots available. So if you have the ability to take time off work or if you don't work 
and would like to join us for Knittopia 2013, we do have, I think, three or four spots available for um, Knittopia 2013. And that would be um, a Sunday through a Thursday. And I don't know the exact dates off the top of my head. And then Knittopia 2014. This week I decided that I am not going to do a lottery for um, 2014. I'm going to go ahead and fill all the spots that are available and then start a wait list and then pull directly from top of the wait list on down um, for any spots that should become available. And the reason that I decided to do this is because last year when um, I was doing the lottery for 2013, um, there wasn't that big of a, of a wait list and a lot of the people came off the wait list and even some of the people that were on the wait list that got their name drawn ended up, they couldn't come, which is completely, completely fine. Um, I know that sometimes, I mean, even now, I mean, a lot of people that registered for 2014 are like, oh, I can't believe I am planning this far ahead. And I totally understand. I just know that we're going to fill up and I have to get the deposit into the cabin to secure the spot. So I need to collect deposit in order to get the deposit into the retreat cabin. So in, in, in an effort to do that, I need to get registrations early so I can send off the money because you never know if somebody's going to take the dates that we want. I don't want to wait too far out. And they won't, they won't reserve it unless they have a deposit. So anyway, for 2014, registration did open up last week or two weeks ago, what, last week, <laughs> crazy, um, but we are, we still have a few spots available, we do have one spot available for the first weekend, we have four spots available for midweek, and two, I have two or three spots, I can't remember, I think there's three spots available for the second weekend, but I'm not 100% sure, and then of course, um, if somebody should happen to back out or doesn't can't send the money right away, then they might have some more spots open up. I have already started a wait list. Uh, one person wanted to be put on the wait list uh, because she can't really commit right now, but she would like the opportunity um, if something should change in the future. So I have already started the wait list, even though we have spots currently available. So if you would like to be put on the wait list, if you are one of those people that can't plan over a year out, but you really would like to attend, get put on the wait list because I'm going to go top to bottom on the wait list um, for filming spots. So if your name's on the wait list and a spot opens up and at that point you can um, commit at that time, then you can get a spot. So let me know if you're interested in coming to Natopia 2014. Oh, I was just reading my notes because I wrote another note on here. Also, what I'm going to do for the people that are on the wait list for 2014, anybody who, that, who does not get off the wait list, for instance, if I have six people on the wait list and nobody drops out, those six people on the wait list for 2014 will get first dibs for 2015, okay? I know, again, we're planning a lot into the future, but if you want to come, then put your name on the wait list. <laughs> and I'm telling you, after you see what goes on at this year's Nettopia, you are going to want to come to 2014. <laughs> so, um, like I said, anybody that does not make it off of the wait list for 2014 will get first dibs at 2015. So I just want to make that clear so that everybody gets a chance who wants to attend can get a chance to attend. So that's all I've got for you this week. I hope you have a great week. I hope your knitting blooms. I am planning on curling up the, on the couch this evening with my Even Star 
and not wearing the knit swirl because it's too warm uh, but with my even star and I hope to knit the night away so I will talk to you next week and again I hope your knitting blooms this week bye for now